Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with another box of Vivaldi. I just did the If I Could Choose Only One Work by Vivaldi, What Would It Be? And one of you said, what do you think of Fabio Biondi's box of Vivaldi stuff? And so here is the box of Vivaldi stuff. I thought we'd talk about it on Errato. It's what, nine discs? Yes, which contains like a lot of Vivaldi. I really, really well performed of all the, let me just be short and say it's a splendid box. It really is. Biondi is a very, very fine performer. His group is marvelous, but I want to tell you a little story because I happen to have been there at the beginning and I think maybe you'll be interested. Fabio Biondi and his group, which was Europa Galante, was originally discovered and promoted by an independent label called Opus 111, Opus 111. Now, Opus 111 was acquired in 2000 by Naive, whence it has since sort of disappeared or been subsumed in, in some way. I'm not sure what's going on with the catalog. It had a beautiful catalog. But, but um, Opus 111 was the brainchild of a French-slash-Polish producer named Yolanta Skura. She originally had worked for Erato as a producer and went off and founded her own label back in the day around 1990 is when she got started. And, you know, this was a time when when the money was flowing, but she was sort of in at the end of when the money was flowing. The tap was soon to be turned off. And, and so she got in at a not ideal time in terms of the economics of the classical music industry. She was one of many really terrific small French labels and independent labels, a lot of them based in France, but independent labels. Um, and Fabio Biondi was one of her, her protégés. So was um, Rinaldo Alessandrini and, and the Concerto Italiano. That was another one of her artists. And Grigory Sokolov was one of her artists. And there were a few others besides. There were about half a dozen, a little bit more. She had a stable of regular artists. She was very artist-based. And like so many labels at the time, she was able to capitalize on the period instrument extravaganza that was going on everywhere because it was so easy to put together a small group of really well-trained period instrument specialists for what that's worth and make really fine recordings of them and they weren't terribly expensive because there was money flowing everywhere there was money in performance there was subsidy money there was there was and they were small groups she wasn't recording the Vienna Philharmonic or the Berlin Philharmonic. It cost her less to make these productions. And she could focus on some lesser known Baroque repertoire and some very well known repertoire. But her big, big splash was Fabio Biondi and, and Europa Galante in Vivaldi's The Four Seasons. Now that disc sold like hundreds of thousands of copies. People went crazy, you know, because every so often it's a phenomenon in the classical music world that that things are kind of quiet for a while. And then a new recording of a war horse shows up and everybody goes nuts for 15 minutes and they sell billions of them. And she was she was a very, very um, vociferous promoter of her discs and her, her, her artists. And I remember her quite vividly. I met her every year for a decade, practically, when I used to go to the Medem convention, um, which was the Marche International du Disque Edition Musicale at the Palais des Festivals in Cannes, France, where I was the chairman of the Cannes Classical Awards. And I represented all kinds of, you know, it, the, originally at least Fanfare magazine and other review magazines and things like that at, at this thing, and then eventually Classics Today, some after we got going. So, so I knew Yolanta pretty well. And she was a, a very sweet looking, attractive woman who ran around with a secretary, um, um, this small you know, French, younger lady who ran around taking notes of everything she said. It was the weirdest thing to have a meeting with her because you would sit talking to her and there would be this person there transcribing everything. And I was never quite sure what the point of any of that was. But she would complain bitterly about distribution in the United States because uh, her distributor at the time was Harmonia Mundi, based out of LA. And of course, Harmonia Mundi was always of, of two minds as a distributor because it had its own label and then it had distributed labels. It had, it still has, I think, or it had Hyperion and, and you know, a bunch of others. I don't know who does them now, but Harmonia Mundi did it at the time. They still have Hyperion, I'm pretty sure, and, and a bunch of others, um, many of them originating in France. 
And she thought that the American market, she couldn't understand why she hadn't sold hundreds of thousands of Beyondy during the four seasons in the United States when it was selling like gangbusters in Europe. Some people, snooty European friends of mine would say, well, it's because Europe is so much more cultured in the United States. That's just bullshit. It's because Europe is smaller. And it's because European territories were centralized and they had centralized record distribution. And that allowed things to appear um, at a uniform time in most record shops, which existed at that time. The United States, on the other hand, is a big, sprawling state-by-state -state enterprise. It's very, very hard to have national distribution of anything in the United States and very expensive. And as a result of that, and the, and the fact that classical record stores were mega stores that were disappearing like crazy throughout the 90s, they all tanked, made it harder for her to sell her stuff. So eventually, eventually she went out of the business and she sold to um, Naive. But in the meantime, Fabio Biondi established his career and went and remade most of the stuff that he did for Opus 111, ironically for Errata, which had been Yolanta Scora's previous label. And so here is the box. And all I need to do is tell you what's in it because the performances are marvelous. He's a first-class violinist. The group sounds great. The only issue I have with these performances sometimes is a touch of excessive haste, about which uh, we, will, we will, I'll get there in, in a moment. So what do we get in here? We have Lestro Armonico, Opus 3, 12 Concerti. We have La Stravaganza, 12 Concerti, Opus 4. We have Il Cimento dell'Armonia e dell'Invenzione, Opus 8, which includes the four seasons and a bunch of other, you know, Concerti Contituli, Concertos with nicknames or titles. And then we have Concertos with Viola d'Amore and more Concerti Contituli with titles. Um, if you want to know what those are, well, let's just take a look, shall we? Um, this is a very inexpensive set, by the way. It's a great deal. I mean, these were originally on um, Virgin Classics or something like that. You know, they're, they're whatever their, they're, what you call it was. Here we are. Uh, let's see. The Inquietudine, Concerto Funebra, The Tempest at Sea, um, La Notte, Night, Per Echo in Lontano, the, you know, Echo Effects. That's fun. Uh, Il Reposo for Christmas. And uh, one that doesn't have a nickname. Okay, so that's fine. That's what's in there. And you get the mandolin concerti, which are lots of fun. And then my personal favorite. Um, well, this is there's two volumes of this. Let me see. One of them is back here somewhere. Ah, concerti per molto strumenti. Oh, I love these. These are the ones with all kinds of crazy instruments, including my all-time favorite Vivaldi concerto. But the first is the Concerto Grosso for 10 instrument, uh, instruments, including violin, two horns, corno de caccia, hunting horns, timpani, uh, oboes, two violins, alto viola, con basso. I mean, that whole pile of stuff. And then you've got like four violins and violins and two cellos and viola d'amore and flute, and but the big ones, the big juicy ones, come with the mandolin concerti. This is concertos for mandolins and lots of things. And the most fun of all of the lots of things is uh, this one. Um, it's number 580, if I can find it. No, it's obviously in here somewhere. Wait a minute, here's, let's see, there's 555, that's one of them. But the big one is a mandolin concerto. And it's number 580, let me find it here. Let's see, Molto Strumenti Volume 2. Oh, here we go. I need Molto Stramenti Volume 1. So let me let me just dig that out. Viola de More. Oh, where is it? I just had it. Wait a minute. I'm going insane. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes, they're all here. So there is RV5 something. That one, 558, thank you. My God, I thought I was going insane. In C major, here it is. Um, it's the one with two violins in tromba marina. No one's quite sure what that is. Um, and two uh, flutes and two mandolins and two chalamo, which are proto-clarinets, and two theorbos and cello. This is a big concerto for Vivaldi, and it is so much fun. And here I think he just sort of races through it a little bit. I think it needs to be more relaxed. This is the one that was transcribed by 
by Alfredo Casella and recorded by Leonard Bernstein at the New York Philharmonic, which is just enormous fun as well. But there have been a few recordings of RV558, remember that number. Um, Claudio Shimoni with Isolisti Vinetti did it, um, and that was a very good one, also on Erato. And so there's like lots of performances of this music, but I love these multiple concertos. They're just everything but the kitchen sink and so terribly evocative and so much fun. Anyway, so there you have it, a wonderful set of Vivaldi concerti, including the major works with opus numbers. And if you want that sort of thing, by all means, go for this. You're absolutely going to love it. You really will. I, I think it's terrific. And I enjoy it enormously. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.